Nonprofit business models, how 501 C3 news organizations are finding sustainability, although I added my own question at the end, or are they? So maybe that'll be one of our topics of discussion today. My name is Mark Rosenwig. I'm an associate professor of television and digital media and journalism at Montclair State, and we're pleased you're all here for the CCM conference. I want to introduce uh, our panelists, starting at the far end. Sue Cross is CEO and Executive Director of the Institute for Nonprofit News. She also runs Cross Strategy, which provides business development, content, and communication services for companies and causes. The Institute for Nonprofit News, she leads a national membership network, more than 110 public interest news organizations and entrepreneurs. INN helps newsrooms develop business funding expertise. Previously, she held a number of key positions with the Associated Press, including Senior Vice President developing media partnerships across the Americas. In the middle, we have John Mooney. John is CEO and education writer for NJ Spotlight, something a lot of us uh, read every day here in New Jersey. It's a New Jersey news and information service, and it's what, about almost seven years old now? Six and a half. Time flies, as we say, which is great focuses heavily on public policy issues. Previously, John was senior education writer for the Star-Ledger and also education and political reporter for the record. And next we have Rebecca Ross. She's the chief operating officer at Chalkbeat, a nonprofit news organization that is covering the effort to improve schools for all children, especially those who have historically lacked access to a quality education. Rebecca's professional experience is focused on launching innovative social programs and building the capacity of social impact organizations. She's been a vice president at Ideas 42 and Seedco, where her work focused on poverty issues, education and financial services for the poor in New York City and nationally. Please welcome our panelists this morning. And the way we're gonna, the way we're gonna, all right. <laughs> Little, wow. I, I think I think I was yeah, on tape delay. Time. I think I was on tape delay there for a minute. Anyway, um, our format this morning is each of our panelists is going to make a short presentation about what they do and their focus on this question. Then we will have discussion. Then we're going to open it up to all of you for questions. So everybody, please start writing down your questions right away. And I'm going to start by uh, calling on Sue Cross. Great. Sue? I'll just sit here and uh, talk from here. Uh, as Mark mentioned, INN is a, is a network, um, including both two members right here. Uh, so we try to serve as a, a service hub and kind of a, an advocate and do a lot of training. We are very focused on sustainability and audience building, not so much what happens in the newsroom. So, when we look across uh, the landscape now, we believe there are about 200 nonprofit newsrooms actively publishing in the US. To put that in perspective, INN was founded just seven years ago with 27 investigative newsrooms. Now, that wasn't all of them, but it was the major players. So, the, the growth in this business model and the growth in this approach is, is really continuing at a very rapid pace. Um, one result of that is that there is not a lot of consistent data. So I can't sit up here and tell you, you know, 38% of members make money from events. We don't know that. We just got some funding to, from the Democracy Fund to create a database that is updated year over year and will give us more authoritative stuff. So what I'm going to talk about is try to paint a picture of what we see across the field and I am uh, reasonably certain it is pretty active because we talk to all our members and we know what they're working on, but there's no data set behind it. And it, it is anecdotal at, at this uh, point. What we see across the landscape, um, in, in this anybody can, can argue with, but we basically see about eight financial pillars out there for nonprofit news. They do have to run as a business, and I think that's really important to stress over and over. I, will, I do talk to a lot of for-profits saying, we can't figure out the economics, we're going to convert to nonprofit. 
and my message is that, you know, that may be a very good decision, but it is not going to solve your economics. The, the need for diverse funding, the uncertainty of the funding mix affects all of them. Nonprofits do have some advantages that I see. They uh, tend to be digital first, so they are more nimble in their outlook when you're talking about, uh, in, in hearing uh, Gordon Burrell talk about the brand and being tied to your legacy brand. It's also people get tied to their legacy operations and revenue. And the nonprofits are very nimble. If they, they will tell me all the time, oh, we tried this, it failed miserably. We're trying something else. There's no like defensiveness about trying to hide what didn't work. Um, so I think that's a huge advantage. In many cases, they have more stable uh, leadership than for profits because the, the amount of pressure to meet market standards and investor return is enormous, and you're seeing tremendous turnover. Um, and uh, people are mission-driven who start nonprofit news organizations and stick with it. That gives them a little longer runway, for the most part, to, to build up to sustainability. Um, they can be more audience-focused and, I think, build a more solid base over time, if you will, because you aren't just trying to meet advertising numbers or mass. Um, and then they can get funding from donors. Um, and that is the flip side of the down, which is you don't, there's a shortage of capital. You don't typically get investment. So those are kind of the big pieces people are dealing with. Um, in terms of business models, we increasingly are seeing it as a spectrum. And this is a spectrum guided by who your audience is. So you're either on this end and you're trying to build a direct audience. Most local publications are trying to build a direct audience. You want people loyal to you who, you know, that's your niche. Um, true, same is true often of topic issues. You're trying to build a direct audience. So that's on one end. On the other end, we have maybe almost half our members whose primary audience is on somebody else's website. So this is particularly true of investigative reporters and some highly specialized in-depth reporters. So there, it's, you're really talking a business-to-business -business model. You're sending your content out. You're not trying to build a direct audience. So in the spectrum from building your own direct audience there to going down to things that are more suitable for kind of B2B or, or distributed content, you have reader revenue, which might be membership, donor, sustaining donor, subscriptions, um, events, which can have all kinds of different models around them but tend to be a thing, um, advertising, sponsorship, and underwriting, I lump together, some treat them a little differently, but the uh, same concept. Then major donors, foundations and grants, um, a studio model, which might be syndication or custom content, that's where you're now switching into, I'm producing this for other people, they're going to build the audience. I'm the content specialist. Professional services, we see everything from native advertising, a lot of training organizations, web design. Um, many of our members are creating unique data sets, and data is a piece of one of their business models. And then finally, so those are kind of the, the seven major revenue categories we see across the sector. I always add an eighth, which is experimentation or innovation. Because they aren't certain, I think every organization is playing and needs to keep playing with different business models and seeing uh, what, what clicks. Um, I wanted to talk a little more about the innovation piece just because we've just literally gotten in the results from the first half of innovation fund grants that went out. These are night and democracy funded grants of about $35,000 each. They're seed grants and they go to organizations to try something new. It might be innovative in the whole field or it may be an innovation somebody else has experimented with somewhere else, but it's new to them. And they, we have given out about a little over a million dollars to 39 organizations over the last three years. So about half of those projects are still in the middle. Yeah, John will talk about one of them. He's our, one of our great success stories. And the idea was to see, can they find new ways of building audience or find some new revenue stream? So in the first ones we just got back, um, 
you know, a, a few were abject failures. You, some of those were um, partnerships or tech development that just really went awry and they didn't go anywhere. Um, and that's, that's okay, we had some interesting learnings from those as well. Um, the ones that did really well tended to be very focused on one concept. Um, they were an extension of something someone was doing. And I'm, I'm going to give you a few examples and then I'll just talk about what we are seeing in terms of approaches that work and approaches that don't work because the specific examples may be interesting to you, but what we're trying to pull are the threads, like what can we take away from these case studies and so forth that really help um, everybody as they're looking for new revenue sources. So uh, one of the great examples, uh, hopefully uh, some of you can be uh, in DC this coming weekend, 100 Reporters is holding uh, a documentary investigative journalism film fest. It's their second one, this is their second year, it's called Double Exposure. So they started that with a seed grant, they hadn't done anything like this. Um, I think they barely broke even that first year because it just took way more effort than they thought, um, but it definitely grew a new audience. For them, the funding impact, it was mostly broadening their grant funders. It is still heavily foundation funded, but from funders who hadn't been involved with them before. And then they do sell tickets. It builds an audience that they believe over time will generate more sustaining donors and major donors. Um, some are very simple. Steve Beatty, who runs The Lens in New Orleans, very small shop, seven people. They cover stuff nobody else covers. They have major influence really on state government. Uh, legislators, council members all really watch them. He took something that was, you know, a pain for almost every newsroom, his request to speak. And he said, can I structure this as like a little mini business? And so he came up with a rate card. They started the Lens Speakers Bureau. Steve swears that what it proves is that reporters are really sexy, and I'm not sure <laughs> I, I quite get there, but um, he said, you know, there's great demand for speakers. It's very modest. They, they net under 10,000 a year, or close to 10,000. That's probably where they'll end up. But it took something that was a cost, a hassle, a pain, and an unused asset, thinking of their reporters in a different way, that these are like public figures people want to hear from and they have expertise that doesn't just go on the website. And he turned it into a business and the 10,000 is enough to matter in his newsroom. So that's a kind of cool, very simple example. We had a lot of success with events and events can have many different business models. I'm not gonna to talk too much about that because John is like the poster child for success on that mm -hmm. um, in it developing into a uh, successful part of their, regular part of their revenue. Um, the last one I just wanted to mention is intriguing to me, and I'm now seeing some others try the same thing, because it addresses, it kind of solves a long-standing problem for investigative reporters, and that is, ad traditionally, advertisers didn't want to be next to investigative news, right? You don't want your big ad next to something that's about crime, corruption, really icky stuff. So it's always been hard to get direct advertising support. Many of our members do watchdog and, and investigative uh, coverage. That's the core of what we are. And so getting sponsors next to that, even if they support the publication, is really difficult to get them to put their name publicly to it. So what is happening now is people are looking and saying, okay, I'm not going to get sponsors for this. You know, my left hand's doing all this investigative reporting. I'm not going to get direct sponsors on that. What can I do over here that people can be more comfortable about without compromising the hard-hitting coverage? And the example I love best is uh, right up in Connecticut, the Connecticut Health Eye Team, Health Investigative Team. They cover what it sounds like. They cover the whole medical system in Connecticut and healthcare, and they've done a lot of exposés of hospital funding, all kinds of things. So doctors, medical groups, that whole establishment are the more, most likely sponsors, but they are not going to publicly put their name against this stuff. Even though they really support this kind of coverage and are glad, they tell them privately, to see it. So they started a, um, really an extension mission, I'd say. They, they started a free 
public health fair in very poor, underserved communities. Their first one was about breast cancer awareness. And so they are pulling booths in, and it's, it's a public fair. It's free to the public, has booths, has testing, it's, but fun stuff too. All the hospitals signed on. The entire medical establishment sponsors it. It does great public good. It has their name, but it's really a different, it's not their core audience. It's a public service in a different way. They get enough sponsorship around that that it's helping underwrite the, the core business. So I kind of call that a left-hand, right-hand strategy. You're not compromising your hard watchdog core, but you are finding some way to make sponsors comfortable around it. Um, so those are, those are the examples from the first half that I thought were really interesting. Um, I, just a few last things on what we saw in terms of what approaches work and, and what don't. Um, what works, as I said, is very targeted efforts. Um, often the simpler they are, the better. Events are generally uh, positive. We saw much higher success rates with audience development than monetization. That may surprise no one in the room. Um, but audience development isn't easy either. And so many of the projects did succeed in finding a new audience or expanding their audience either through partnerships or something new. And now they really need to try to go back. Some, some of their ideas of how to monetize that audience didn't, just didn't really pan out. So su partly successful, still valuable, but not all the way there. The things that we found were not generally successful were um, apps, people who tried to build apps. And I kind of go back, the first round of this, the selections were made at a time when apps were like the thing. Everybody had an app. So now in hindsight, you know, you can kind of look and go, oh, it's just that the, the investment is so high for the return. And in many cases, people thought people would flock to an app. And now you kind of look and think, well, you don't really need an app for that. Tech uh, development of all sorts was challenging. Um, in some cases, it produced really good stuff that's now being released open source. So it may have done a lot of good, but maybe wasn't um, the new revenue source. And the third thing that was really challenging are partnerships that rely on one partner to monetize what the other partner is doing. And it wasn't a lack of faith. It seems to me like just too many different cultures and not expertise in the right places of how to, how to sell that. So the, the things we draw from those overall are, you know, really focus on one revenue play, um, overestimate your expenses universally, successful and unsuccessful, everybody grossly underestimated the time and cost. So think of it like, you know, a home renovation or a kitchen redo, it's going to cost twice as more in time and attention than you initially think, and just build that in um, into that. And the kind of ancillary thing with that is a two-part. We saw a lot of business plans that are one-year business plans. You get the seed grant, here's what it's going to look like, and in the applications, if people don't think to year two and three, if you think of it like climbing a mountain, you don't know if it's going to be worth climbing that mountain. You have to think through, if this really works, what would I net after I don't have the seed grant, maybe expenses come down a little, what does year two and three look like? Is it going to be worth this climb on that? By and large, people start to make money and we see the proof of the model in year two. And that's year two rocks. You know, year one, even the really successful ones barely broke even. So it's looking out a little more. Those are the overall threads. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great way to tee it up. Uh, I was told there was a clicker, but I haven't found yes, it Yes, there is a clicker. And yes, but I'm just going to bring this to you so they can record. Excellent. And we'll leave it here for John next. So hi everyone, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Chalkbeat um, and I'm excited to tell our story. Um, imagine in about 2008 two people who are really passionate about 
journalism and education, literally kind of blogging about these issues in, in basements, in one in Denver and, and one in New York City. Um, and the journalism was really high quality and it was, un and then it was really focused on um, the education debate and specifically issues of educational inequity. Um, but it was very clear that each was looking at their work and saying, I have a real sustainability challenge here, what am I going to do? Um, and they actually met and found each other at a conference, at a journalism conference. Um, and, and then with the mentorship of, of, of a now board member, um, realized that, that their fu the future would be, a, you know, a sustainable future for them would be to come together into a network model. They were each doing really similar things. Um, why not, you know, bind, you know, combine forces and figure it out if there were going to be a more sustainable way to do what they were doing. Um, and so that was the beginning of Chalkbeat. Um, and today we're, we're not only in, in New York and, and Colorado, but we're also in Tennessee and Indiana. Um, we recently launched a pilot in Detroit that we're actively fundraising around. We're also exploring a launch in, in Newark. Um, we also are investing in some national team members to do coverage that we're calling kind of national local that ties together the local stories that are coming out through our journalism and looking at national trends. Um, and it's an exciting time for us because we're really growing um, and here to tell these stories to our committed readers who are teachers and um, professionals at schools and education insiders and lawmakers and also just curious citizens. And our goal is to help inform conversations about the education debate and specifically educational equity issues. Um, we're very focused on impact, so as we're thinking so hard about um, increasing our reach and also improving our sustainability, but impact, it will never do that at the expense of impact, both locally and systematically. Um, to give you a sense of what that feels like for us, uh, this, that picture represents um, a story series that we did in, in Indiana, where we realized that there was a huge divestment in services for English language learners, um, yet there was a huge influx of immigrants and people who needed those services and we did we did a story and it ended it resulted in the doubling of, of funding for English like English language learners in Indianapolis um, so you know we're, we're all we're we're looking locally at the things we do we're looking systematically just last week at a conference that Sue led we released um, an open source code to our impact tracking tool called Mori um, we're making efforts to try to build the field around impact um, where we are in terms of reach, we're currently um, reaching about 200,000 people, um, average monthly users. Um, we're not satisfied with that. We really seek to grow and feel like that is the secret to our financial success. Um, and right now, can you go back one yeah. second? Um, so, uh, but we, but our, our coverage is, our local reporting um, on our website and in our daily newsletters is really amplified by our national and local distribution partners. Um, the Atlantic has been a tremendous partnership um, for us. Um, so uh, 20,000 people are reading, you know, 20 to 40,000 people are reading, you know, each of these stories that we write. Um, we're also partnering with all these other um, da local dailies. Um, and in the future, when, when you say, well, what does Chalkbeat look like at scale? Um, we want to be in, in about 15 locations. Um, we want to be serving at least a million unique. So the real question around sustainability is, how do you get from here to there? Um, in terms of our cost structure, we're right now a $4 million organization. We've got, we'll have 30 people by the end of the, by the, end of the fiscal year. Um, we're covering about 12 to 15% of our expenses through earned revenue. Um, and, you know, as I said, we, we're a network model, so we're doing this local journalism, but we also have a centralized network um, that provides all of the strategy work, the editorial support, the technology, the business support on the back end, and I think there are tremendous efficiencies to that. Um, it was just a year ago that we separated from a fiscal sponsor where, where we had been incubated, um, and so now we're a fully independent 501c3 organization, and it's been a really interesting transition. To, it was a great decision for us then to have been incubated and, to, and there's a lot of cost savings there. And now, as we're poised for growth, it was the right time for us to um, clip our wings and to develop our own infrastructure. So the future, we aspire to be about a $12 million organization and, and, and we, we, we feel passionate about the need to cover more of our expenses through earned revenue, hopefully 30 to 50% at scale. 
Um, so our take, like so many other peoples in the room and at today's conference, is that we believe the public interest journalism is a public good. The market's never going to you know, fully sustain it. So it's always going to be, for us, a combination of earned revenue and philanthropy that's going to, to allow us to thrive. Um, I think, uh, you know, as, as, as a network or a national organization, I do think that we are, have a competitive advantage because we can, you know, attract local funders w for our local journalism, but also large national um, philanthropists for our network and our national work, and that is what enables us to build a centralized operation and to innovate. Um, I think it's also interesting that we are a, 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 we're a single subject site, and so it allows us to access education philanthropy dollars, but also dollars that are focused on civic engagement um, and journalism, and I do think that that helps us tremendously in terms of diversifying our philanthropy. Um, and in terms of earned revenue, it looks very much like what Sue said. Um, we're, we, we right now, I think, have, we're, we're, we're working on a diverse set of, of revenue sources, but we need to deepen those sources and we need to diversify them even further. Right now, about 65% of our revenue comes from our website and our newsletter. Um, we also have a job board I'll talk about in a second. We do some events, we do reader contributions. Um, but it's not enough. And I think the key to our thinking about sustainability is that we just can't, we just have to, have to continue to push to innovate or else we are going to wither. Um, so I wanted to just highlight a few of the sources and, and what, what our approach is to them and why we've decided to dig in on them. Um, this is a, in terms of sponsorships, which is, I said makes up the, the majority of our earned revenue right now, um, this is just a testimonial from one of our university partners in Colorado. Um, I mean, what we've done is uh, that just basically says that we've helped them double the number of people who are participating in their licensure, licensure programs for principals. Um, and to me, this is all about just identifying the niches um, uh, within our market of like who's got the marketing dollars and who wants to reach our audience. And for us, it's been higher ed because education people love credentials and professional development, and that's been a tremendous niche for us. We also get a lot of dollars from the advocacy community and people who want to get their word out about their take of the education debate. Um, and, and I think there's another community of unions, public unions, that are, that are passionate sponsors. Um, so for us, it's really just about figuring out what these niches are and figuring out where the dollars are. We still have a lot of work to do to figure out the national marketing landscape. Um, and this, to me, is a really interesting product. We have a jobs board. Um, this is something that happened so organically, but generates for us $70,000 of revenue a year. Um, and it was just like a number of years ago, we realized that we were getting lots of inquiries from people about, do you know about a job? Or I'm an employer and I want to market my job to people who read your site. And we just realized that there was a real opportunity there. And we very quickly put together just a WordPress plugin plug-in theme, we threw it up on our website without too much thought, and it's, it really runs itself with very minimal back-end development all work. Right? Um, it's all education yeah. focused, and we've even tried to share it with some of our you know, colleagues in the field, like The Notebook in Philadelphia, so that other people can kind of plug into this effort. Um, but to me, this is a model of how I want to help us find other kinds of reader-focused uh, revenue opportunities in the future. For example, right now, people post events on our website because they all are doing events, they want people to know about them, and I'm, I'm realizing, oh, if they've paid a small amount of money, um, there's just money that is being left on the table. So we're looking at things like um, a micro ad space where people can post events. Um, but, it, but it goes back to the ideas that were discussed earlier about being able to innovate, being nimble, being willing to try stuff, and, and being willing to fail. Um, I'm going to skip events because I think uh, John's going to have much more to share on that. Um, and I'll end on, on an end of year campaign. Um, so we started doing this a couple of years ago, and we had no experience doing it. But we said, why not? Everybody does it. We should do it. Um, and just every, year over year, we just continue to gain experience in doing this. Um, so last year, we tripled what we had done the year previous. And this year, we're trying to double that. Um, and I think my learning from this is that 
Um, you really, we get better and better as we gain experience, but also as we gain professional staff, um, you know, who, who, who have the project management skills, who know how to, we can create the intersections between our development team and our product team. We can leverage pro bono graphic design support from, you know, outsiders, which is expertise that we don't have in-house. Um, and to me, every year I'm trying to figure out how we can lay the foundation for a future membership model. What am I learning as we do, as we do an end of year campaign that tells me about what our readers want from us and what they're getting from us. And so it's our aspiration to turn these learnings into a broader membership mo um, model down the line. Um, but again, it, it is taking us, you know, we're learning as we go, we're making the proper investments, um, and I think we're building the foundation. And so the last slide is just, you know, to, to summarize some of the things that we're trying, you know, our ad re revenue actually had a dip last year. It was stronger in 2014 than it was last year. And we can't rest on our laurels. We're now going to experiment with sponsored content this year. Um, I mentioned micro ads and membership, and we're always on the lookout for other premium products. Just last week, our product team was talking about, you know, a data repository that could be really useful to people as school closures happen. We're going to look into that. Um, so I, I just feel like, Again, as I said, I, for me, the secret to thinking about our sustainability and getting from you know, four to five sites to 15 and getting from four million to 10 to 12 million is really about, is about being dogged, about thinking about the need to, of the sustainability question and constantly pushing us forward, having the right mix of professional staff that can do this nimble creative project management cross silos, so to speak. Um, and also, you know, just getting investments, not in narrow and specific projects, but in the staff that, ena that enable us to do this kind of innovation. Can you, um, I have two questions. Uh, can you pull up our site? Are you online? And do you have sound? I'll start, and while you, and we'll see if it works. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for for joining us. Um, I am the CEO and founding editor of NJ Spotlight. Uh, as, as Mark mentioned, it was six years ago, actually now seven, where um, I was working uh, with a bunch of our colleagues at the Newark Star Ledger, and they uh, went through a massive buyout where have literally half the newsroom left and we took it and on, on the belief that it was a bigger risk to, to stay than to leave um, and we started up, four of us started NJ Spotlight uh, with $10,000 seed grant um, from the Community Foundation of New Jersey basically our, continues to be our fiscal agent um, we have not clipped our wings yet we're, 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 <laughs> We, we see many benefits of, of being there, and, and I think they want us to leave, but we, we hang in there. Um, and uh, started with four of us and $10,000 and a business plan. Um, and basically the business plan six years ago was to be a news site covering public policy issues in New Jersey on the belief that as newspapers shrunk, um, these were issues that were falling by the wayside, uh, the beat the beat reporting that we had all done. And I had co I've covered education for 20 years, and, and others had, um, we covered our, our co core areas, our education, healthcare, public finance, and energy and environment. And these were all, we were all veteran reporters on this, and, and folks actually came to us, you know, we know you've left the ledger, how do we keep you alive? And, and so this was really the foundation of, of the journalism uh, when we started. And the initial plan was to sell newsletters every, um, and we had a business plan for it, and we'd sell newsletters uh, every, every uh, week, um, and that would provide us the revenue. And we had this great business plan that had us growing quickly and so on and so forth. And, and literally the first week, Friday came, we were gonna put out our first newsletter. We were incredibly exhausted from a long week of re reporting. We said, okay, let's put off the newsletter idea. Um, and, um, and so we just, we decided, let's, let's do the journalism for a little while. We have a little money. We started with some Knight Foundation money, um, a fair amount of Knight Foundation money. And so we continued the journalism. And organically, we, we had a sales guy, um, a publisher, was one of our founders, still is uh, with us. Um, organically, we started doing, he started getting some inquiries about doing some events. 
And, um, and would you, if, if you guys held the events, you know, we'll, we'll provide some sponsorship for it. And we, in our first year, we did six to eight events. Um, and it, they were always, they're around very specific issues, charter schools, uh, solar energy, electric cars, uh, it evolved into Obamacare. Um, and it literally grew slowly but surely where we had uh, got to the point where a, a good third of our income came out of events uh, and sponsorships of events. Uh, we also do, as a bit of a side business, we do things around um, webinars, uh, which are, um, you know, a little bit less, also have sponsorships, much more of a tutorial-based idea than they are a, uh, an, a, a gathering of folks. We get a couple people on a webinar, it's much less uh, labor-intensive for us as well, and we don't raise as much money off of it, but also with sponsors. Um, and it slowly grew for us and, and, and proved successful in a, in a number of ways. Obviously, the revenue was important for us, but it also in terms of bringing in folks who are, um, you know, serving our mission of public engagement, and, and that was really important for us. Uh, our audience is, is, is a mix. Uh, oftentimes, it's a lot of people who are in those fields, and they want to meet the, the uh, panelists and, and, and us, for that matter, and, and, and want that networking, but also there's a general public to it. And in the beginning, we were charging some money, um, oftentimes not a whole lot, but $25 to $50. Um, but we slowly moved away from that uh, in terms of, um, you know, it, it didn't raise enough money for us that it made a huge difference. Uh, the one gain of charging is people, if they paid even $10, they'll show up. If they haven't paid anything, they may not show up. So there was, there's, there's some value to that. But we decided to serve our mission. We didn't, certainly didn't want to exclude folks. Uh, and so we, we, at this point, do not charge for, for those smaller events. And then two years ago, and this is, we can try the scroll down. Two years ago, we started, up, oh, go back up. We started NJ Spotlight on Cities. Um, and it is uh, basically a day-long event. This, we're holding our second one in a week. And, and uh, Paul is with us here. We're all frazzled putting this thing together. And so, um, you know, if I skip over some facts. But this was an event we wanted to put some focus on our urban areas and the urban issues. And, um, and you can, here, scroll back up. Uh, go, go to um, agenda. And as you'll see, I mean, it basically we want to have these conversations around core issues facing the state and, and core, core issues facing our cities. And, and this year we have a big focus on next year's gubernatorial election. You might have seen from the headline beforehand that we've already chosen our governor, it sounds like, um, even before we've chosen a, uh, a president. Um, but it's going to be our first new governor, obviously, in eight years. It's been a tumultuous eight years uh, under this current governor. And there's lots of issues that are need addressing. Um, and, and so we have focused this being on an urban agenda where our keynote speakers are going to be Newark's Mayor Roz Baraka and former Governor Tom Kane will speak together uh, with me and, and sort of a dual uh, keynote. And then the end event will be a conversation among those who want to be governor uh, next year. And then in between, we have a range of talks, some on affordable, you know, broader ones on affordable housing and community schools and, and sort of some of those big issues. And then we also have what we call these little spotlight talks, which are really, there's sort of a lightning round where it's 10, 15 minutes um, conversation around some specific issue. We have an opioid uh, intervention coach who's going to talk about a day in his life. And this is a guy who I sat with for a half hour and he literally took 30 phone calls or text messages from folks who needed detox beds. And, you know, and he, he's a former addict himself. I said, just talk for 15 minutes. Your, your story is amazing. Um, and so it's the mix of that. And, and last year, we had great success with it. We raised uh, six-figure amounts. And this is where I give a plug to my right. Um, uh, Sue and INN gave us a seed grant, which was really important for us getting it off the ground. And in fact, um, our big worries was whether we would even break even, and that really gave us a cushion not to have that as a, as a sole uh, worry. In fact, we ended up making um, $50,000, $60,000 off of that one event, and it really launched us on a way where, where this year we've even added more sponsors. Um, we sold eight to ten sponsors, anywhere from $2,000 to uh, $15,000, I think. But I wanted to show, yep, look at you, you're doing very well. Um, 
Now, I wanted to show, um, just to give you a sense of, of, of the event, go back up. Paula, where would the video be off of? It's on the first page. So go back to the first page, home. And if we have sound, then, yep, yeah, scroll down, click on, yeah, and see if, do you think we have sound? Yep. This is a convocation where we brought together a group of Can you get louder? To talk about the major issues facing the Jersey cities. We've had more than 60 speakers, uh, 20 programs across three rooms over the course of the day, and everybody from former governors and the U.S. Attorney to the head of the schools in Newark. We had CEOs, educators, we had planners, we had some of the top developers in the state. You know, it was a, a great uh, cross-section of New Jersey and people who really make a difference in our cities. We have 565 municipalities, but we have at least 80 cities, urban centers of some size, and they are now looking to redevelop, revitalize. There's a whole new generation coming up that is going back to the city. They're not living in the suburbs like their parents did. We wanted to look at the whole issue. The beauty of AJ Spotlight uh, is really the spotlight that you provide on a bunch of issues that people need to talk about that maybe aren't talking about as much as they should. They gather together some of the very best minds in the state of New Jersey. Those who are driven by a passion to figure out not just what's wrong, but what to do about what's wrong. We can now make progress since we uh, undertake and address some very important social and economic issues that affect people every day. Spotlight has a ton of credibility as sort of the leading voice for journalism on policy issues in the state. So to have them host and structure the moderation of the panels, I think it's really made it almost newsworthy. It's really been provocative. I think that Spotlight offers a unique platform where a nonpartisan unbiased, not-for-profit, professional, journalistic news organization. We don't have any dog in the fight. We try to give people an understanding of what's it all about. What's the context? What are people proposing? It's balanced. And you don't get that in the news anymore today. We tend to not have city officials kind of engaging. So I think it's always positive to you know have the, the journalists, the, uh, the laymen, and then kind of wrap it up with you know our local elected officials because they should be our champions and our advocates. Increasingly, we're in an online world where we're doing all this conversation online, and I think you need to get in the same room sometimes. The most active and interested people involved in public policy in New Jersey and in cities are here today. So if you want to reach them, it's one way. So that that's our story. Um, we love that video. Um, we show it anywhere we can, um, but it's it is it, it's proven to be. I mean, it's this this notion of live journalism. It's it's not just about drawing sponsorships, but but ha making stories out of these events. Uh, we we write about these events. One of the things we're going to have it at this one is an interactive session. What it's sort of an unconference model. We're f we're just going to get folks in the room. What what should we be talking about in terms of an urban agenda? Um, we did some polling around it. Eagleton Institute in, at, at uh, Rutgers did some polling around people's impressions of of their cities. And these are all these are news. Uh, and, and getting that out in different ways, through events, through, we're gonna podcast every one of the talks, we're gonna live stream. These are just the different platforms we're using now. It's not all just writing it anymore. So, um, so I think it, it certainly adds to, the, to our strength as a, as a journalistic em enterprise, and certainly as it, hopefully as it continues to grow, will add to our strength as a, as a sustainable business. Okay, I have a couple of questions for you guys, and then we're going to open the floor for our audience questions. First one is, I call it kind of the reality check question. Sue, um, what's the trend now? Are we seeing more news organizations going nonprofit? Is it flat, or are some of them failing? What's what's going on? What's the reality um, of this? All of the above. The I believe the rate of growth is higher than the uh, failure rate. And actually one of the things that really surprised me coming into this a year ago is that the failure rates are actually pretty low. You know, half of nonprofits, half or more, or excuse me, half of startups of any kind fail, half or more. We're seeing maybe uh, definitely under 10%, I'm guessing somewhere around 
5%, and that maybe is over a three-year period. So when I look back three years, all the ones we were aware of, we saw about somewhere between 5 to 10% that we could find in old lists from um, a number of years ago were no longer publishing. But it's much smaller hmm. than we expected. Now, I do yeah, think is. there are others that will continue to fall off. Um, the biggest reason I suspect, and again, I, I don't have data to, to back this up, but is we're seeing startups go into it really undercapitalized. They're started by journalists. They're uncomfortable building, fundraising and selling. And so they try to do it on a shoestring, and those are the ones that really have a tough time. If somebody can find one major donor, one foundation, a significant amount to give them enough so that they can have an editorial product and hire somebody who's focused on the business, even part-time, right from the get-go, they have a much higher survival rate. So we are just starting to see for-profits convert to non-profits. Um, Honolulu Civil Beat converted, and um, we're helping them as, as their fiscal sponsor make that bridge till they get their 501c3. Uh, Rivard Report, which is a pretty large publication in San Antonio, converted. And um, they had an ad business, but they also had people who wanted to donate to them. Is it a trend yet? I don't know. We, we are seeing it, and you never used to see that. Um, so we'll, we'll see. The Philadelphia, the Fairbanks, Alaska, and those where they're handed to a, um, a nonprofit foundation to become the owner, that's yet a different thing. And I don't think we know yet where that goes. Rebecca and John, you deal in advocacy journalism in certain ways, or you, you mentioned people that have advocacy uh, goals in mind. How do you create a firewall between that and your fundraising? I mean, I would say, I wouldn't, I, I think of us as public interest journalists, but we very much stay away from the term advocacy. Um, we do start at Chalkbeat with the value proposition that kids, that, that kids deserve a better education, and that in particular, low-income kids uh, do, um, but we are agnostic about how to get there, and so we're very clear about being not advocates and being unbiased. Um, but that said, we do spend a lot of time thinking about the firewalls that you referenced. Um, we have a code of ethics that's posted on our website now that really details um, our, our priorities in terms of preserving the integrity of the journalism and the transparency, while at the same time acknowledging that there really no, there really isn't a, a Chinese wall between our editorial team and our business operations. That actually, in fact, to do the kinds of things that I was talking about earlier, we we do need to collaborate in pretty clever ways. Um, but we need to build in in safeguards. Um, and so we have very simple policies around disclosures. Um, we 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 make sure that we don't take funding to do specific stories, for example. Um, we make sure that um, as we take money for sponsorships that our sponsors are not at all determining um, the content of the things that we're doing. Um, but it really was important for us to codify the Code of Ethics. We have our team um, sign it when they join the organization. We have them um, sign it annually to make sure that we're getting their eyes back on it. And it's also important that we educate our sponsors and our funders about our, our, our stance on this. And we've had to have some hard conversations um, with funders um, to explain to them our perspectives. John, what's your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I um, you know, worked for 20 years as, as a reporter where you know, I, I literally, probably once in my, uh, in my career at a newspaper, was I ever approached about what an advertiser might care about, and and that was way back in 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 a weekly. But you know, as as I moved to bigger and bigger papers, you were totally insulated from any of those business concerns. Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, we're a staff of of ten or twelve, and and I I serve as a CEO role and and do a lot of or hope to do a lot of fundraising. And there's and there's, I I am very cognizant of where the money comes from. Um, you know, we, we certainly have all the policies and, and, the, and the form of firewalls, but it's, it's harder, uh, you know, to, to, to um, sort of tread that line. And, and I think we are, and it, it gets raised with us once in a while, oh, you know, NJA, the big teachers union, is one of your advertisers. And, um, you, know, you know, 
that you, you're towing their line. And, and we're often able to rest on our, our track records as, as solid 20-year reporters that will do good journalism. But, but it's something that you face, and, and, um, and it's, it is trickier. I don't do any of our, our work in terms of sponsorships with those I cover. Um, I'm really the one who probably crosses the two lines, but we certainly, we ask our reporters when we're putting together panels, uh, oftentimes our reporters are going to be the moderator of those panels. We're going to ask them who would, who would be good panelists to be on. Um, and so they're, as you're saying, we work together on these things, uh, but it, it is trickier. I mean, it's just we don't have, you know, the institutional firewalls that we used to have, and, and we just have to continue to do good journalism. I think that's our biggest defense, is, is that we're not pulling our punches on, on anybody, hopefully, uh, let alone our, anyone who might be sponsoring us. And to communicate internally is uh, what Very your policies important. Yeah. are. And, it's, and you know, I think um, the, the city's event has been interesting because we used to often have, uh, we'd find a sponsor first to do an event. Um, and one of the drawbacks of that is it's not very nimble. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of lead up time then um, in terms of pulling off an event. Um, and by doing cities, we basically made a, uh, a decision that we're going we're gonna to have an event. And whether you come or not, um, or whether you, we have sponsors or not, and then the sponsors started flowing to that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that took us a while, and, and now we're, we're able to put together programs that are actually in the news. One of our speakers is the mayor of uh, Elizabeth, who, um, where those bombs, uh, you know, that latest uh, terrorism attack uh, came out of. Um, and I were, you know, it happened two weeks ago. I grabbed him, I said, can you talk for 15 minutes about it? Uh, and he's more than willing. The guy can't stop talking. So, um, but it, but it, by doing it that way, uh, we're not so beholden to, to sponsors. Okay, great. All right, we're going to open the floor to to your questions for our panelists. Yes, Susan. Sounds great. I'm sorry to come late, but I'm trying to um, Sue, I was just wondering about the board. Um, are you faced with many more requests for membership, and how high is the bar when you're looking at these very issues? You're looking at editorial policies, the things you require mm -hmm. in order for nonprofits to become a member of INN. Yeah, we do. We've had very steady growth. Um, you know, we get several applications a month, um, and it goes in, in spurts. So there's a lot. Um, we do look at, we look at two things, that people list their funding sources and are transparent and that they do have an editorial um, independence policy. And there, there is an issue we are wrestling with in fascinating discussion actually at Columbia on Wednesday that circled around it too. Philanthropy is very much broadening from foundations to individual donors and as boomers retire and go to the great beyond, um, there's, you know, that's going to pick up. There's an enormous amount of wealth being handed off by individuals. And so mon m much of that is coming through these donor advised funds and individuals want to stay private in many cases. So you have that and so you can technically meet our requirements by listing the donor advised fund. You don't necessarily know the donor behind it. And there's not an easy answer to that. On the one hand, most of it, that is harmless. It's individuals who just don't want to be approached. On the other hand, there are a number of nonprofits that their entire funding is anonymous. And so they say, look, we have editorial independence. Obviously, we have no idea who's funding us. We can't possibly be bought. On the other hand, there's a transparency to the reader. And that just doesn't feel comfortable. And so INN has not accepted them into membership. But where that line should be is not at all clear. Um, the one thing I'd say is that we also increasingly, we are getting a lot of inquiries from non-members. We are finding there are for-profit sites using our website resources heavily. And um, we're a fairly small staff. We have eight people. Five of them are on the technical crew. We get 30 to 50 inquiries a week, for individual inquiries for help, guidance, connections, whatever, and that's growing. And many of those are people 
who are not members or are starting up and so forth. So we're just kind of looking at how to handle that whole thing. We want to be a resource beyond the membership as well. And you require your members to disclose all their donors, right? We, the, the line now is uh, we require members to disclose all donors over $1,000. Realistically, I don't think that's happening. And we, rather than taking a, we're going to police this and boot you out, we're really trying to engage in a discussion because it's almost all coming through the donor advised funds. The board has looked at, should we raise that to 5,000, which is a very common limit in some IRS guidelines and a common limit for Knight Foundation requires grantees to disclose over 5,000. So that's a practical matter. And then they also have been talking about, could we make it a five and five guideline? So you disclose everything above 5,000 and you attest on your website that you don't accept, you, more than 5% of your revenue doesn't come from anonymous donors. Hmm. Um, but I suspect there are quite a few members as I've had these conversations, that it is more than 5% of the revenue is coming from anonymous donors. As everyone builds membership programs, as they build sustaining donors, as they build local support, particularly for local publications, it is coming. So we're wrestling with that. Other questions? Yes. Um, you spoke uh, initially about that some strategies and audience engagement were working well and that the challenge comes in monetizing mm -hmm. and building audiences. So I wanted to know if you guys could speak to that. that I know we talked a lot about events, but how do you get new audiences and then what might be ways that we can mm -hmm. use those audiences to support? I, that's such a central question for us. This mm -hmm. past year, we were forced to thinking about how to prioritize. Do we prioritize audience growth? or do we prioritize sustainability? Because at the end of the day, there's only so many hours right. <laughs> in it, and we really had to figure out what our goals should be. And we, 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 of course we acknowledge we have to do, be doing all of these things simultaneously, but we actually put our money on, we need to spend this year growing our audience um, because it's going to help facilitate the, re the, the revenue generation that we are talking about. Um, and what we realized that for us, um, that we really needed to focus on our improving our digital readership. Um, and so we've decided to focus on everything from Facebook growth to hiring a growth editor to really centralize our social media accounts, and that's a role that we're hiring for right now, but I really think it's going to help catapult you know, our readership because it's going to allow our editorial staff to focus on what they do really well, and then it's going to improve, I think, our headline writing and, our, and the other ways that we engage people. Um, so I would also say that from the events perspective, we've also been doing events. And from my perspective, I'm looking at them as, oh, potential revenue generation. Um, and, we, we've, and we have had sponsors, and we have done ticketed events, and we keep kind of breaking even. And I keep saying, why, and is that okay? And then I, I've reached the conclusion of, oh, it's okay, because right now, the purpose of our events is for audience development and brand building. Um, and that's okay, and that's like what we need to be doing right now to build Chalkbeat as a brand. And our next phase will be figuring out how to pivot into kind of more revenue generating events. Um, so to be honest, we have prioritized audience building over sustainability. If you were really, you know, looking at the dollars that we're spending, and I think this current fiscal year we're in, the pendulum is swinging back, and we're focused more on sustainability. Um, but audience growth is huge and enables all the other things that we were talking about. Yeah, and I would add partnerships to that. Um, very important in terms of distribution is working with other news sites. We work with all the public media in New Jersey, um, and you know, any which way uh, we can get our, our, and it doesn't always lead to clicks either. I mean, I, I'll admit, um, I mean, one of the things we do, it, we, we get reprinted in the Philadelphia Inquirer often, and we don't get a click out of, a single click out of that. Um, but it is, it does build the brand, and it makes you more recognizable, and, and getting on TV and, you know, with, with uh, public television and on the radio with public radio, I mean, I think these are all things that just get your name more and more known out there. Um, and certainly getting into, there, there is technology now that's imperfect, but it, but it has helped us um, uh, more than once, technology where you can, 
in our, in our case, NJ.com will run our stories in full, um, and we both get a click out of it. Um, and we actually get even an ad that goes with it. So there's, and when something runs in NJ.com, which is a sort of a nine million behemoth, um, nine million uh, clicks behemoth, it really skyrockets our audience. Now it may be just for that story, admittedly, and that's part of the game. Um, you know, a lot of times our, when we have a, an incredible month, it's often off, off of one or two things mm -hmm. that just went pseudo viral. Uh, and there are also the things that you wouldn't necessarily think. And, there, you know, we don't do cat videos yet. Um, Why not? Give us time. But we'll do a list or we'll do a map of data and they fly. And we write a 2,000, 3,000 word expose and less so. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting how much you want to chase, you know, those clicks and how important that is. Or, you know, in our case, we know our readership is you know, the state house and the governor's office. And those are, you know, if you're going to cover policy, those are the things that, those are the people you do want to reach. We've come to the end of our allotted time, but I'm sure our panelists will be around for individual questions. And please join me in, in thanking Sue, Rebecca, and John for being with us today and sharing their insights. <laughs>